Structured a society. What do you say about this? Minister! <laughs> so my adventure began and possibly put at risk a secure future. He left behind the world he knew to seek the riches and wealth of unknown lands. For a year or more, we sailed the great oceans of the world. Ambition inspired his journey. We swam with mermaids and we carried fabulous cargoes of silks and spices. Nature changed his destiny. Dying not important. All men die. What matters is how you die. Then you'll die like warriors. This is my island! Hello everyone, we are Group 9. Adi Indah Julianti, Dini Rismawati, Eri Yulia Siahaan, Yuni Rosalin. We are going to tell something about one important period in English literature. That is the 18th century or the Augustan age. We are the Atlantis. The first point is about historical background and literary features. The second is about the rise of the novel, including the novel after 1750. The third one is about Augustan poetry. And the last one is about journalism and criticism, as well as letters and diaries. Now let's take a look at the first part, the historical background and literary features. When Queen Anne died in 1714, the German House of Hanover took over the British throne. They were King George I and King George II. During this period, the monarchy was not popular. There were two rebellions by the Catholic son and grandson of James II in 1715 and 1745, but both were defeated. Meanwhile, the power of parliament and prime minister continued to grow. There were also happened the unification of Great Britain and the great expansions of colonialism. Some big events like Industrial Revolution and Agricultural Revolution, also American Declaration of Independence in 1776, French Revolution in 1789, the Theater Licensing Act of 1737, and Scientific Revolution marked by famous scientists like Isaac Newton, Kepler, Galileo, and John Locke influenced the life of many people in many aspects. The revolution in industry and agriculture made British trade grew enormously. Many people moved to other cities to work. The American independence and French Revolution brought new mood of freedom and spirit of liberty, equality, and fraternity echoed. Those brought many changes in mind, the way people thought, etc. Rational mind, liberal thought, and criticism grew among people. The intellectual climate made people more critical about what happened and what should happen. There were coffee houses and clubs where people gathered to talk and discuss about many things happening in life, including political issues. As we know, there were two political parties, Whig and Tory, that had different beliefs about what was better to British, parliamentary monarchy or absolute monarchy. One of the most critical elements of the 18th century was the increasing availability of the printed materials both for readers and authors. All types of literature were spread quickly in all directions. Newspapers began and even multiplied, also magazines. The positive side of the explosion in information was that the 18th century was markedly more generally educated than the centuries before. Contributions to science, philosophy, economics, and literature came from all parts of the kingdom. It was the first time that literacy and a library were all that stood between a person and education. Now we come to the literary features. The 18th century literature is broadly divided into two categories. First half is called Augustan Age or Age of Pop, and the second half is known as the Age of Johnson. The Augustan Age is also known by different names such as the Age of Neoclassicism, the Age of Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, the Age of Scandal, the Age of Exuberance, and the Age of Sensibility. There are reasons for those names. 
Why Augustan Age? The explanation is from the first half of the 18th century, writers took inspiration from the Latin poets, ancient Roman poets, Virgil, Horace, and Ovid, who lived under the Emperor Augustus. They imitated Latin writers and translated many of their works. The name of Neoclassicism Age is due to the writers who modeled much of the works on classical writers and revered to ancient Greece and Rome using subjects from classical mythology and history that brought to the birth of a new movement known as Neoclassicism. Why Age of Enlightenment or Age of Reason? It was a period of intellectual climate, wisdom, and scientific thought. During this age, rational code and logical reasoning was given a lot of importance. People focus on thinking, on reasoning. This age was powered by scientific discoveries such as by Isaac Newton. The age of scandals was given by Terence White. At the time, others dealt specifically with the crimes and devices of their world. The term age of exuberance was given by Donald Green. The 18th century marked the break in thoughts between medieval survivors and modern trends. Natural rights and democracy went hand in hand. The name Age of Sensibility was given because common satire was rendered gentler and more diffuse after Swift and Pope died. We go forward to the next item, that is the characteristic of this period. As already mentioned, we may tell that this age had been political influence. People were more rational and reasoning-minded. Satire were dominantly seen in literature. Drama was less due to the act of 1737. There were the rise of the novel and the emerge of the journalism and diaries. Imitation of Rome period and neoclassicism were also happened. The Augustan age was transitioned to romanticism and transitioned from structure and formality to the emotional ungoverned writings. This age had extreme concern about intellect, form, and order. The age of Johnson was actually the ending of neoclassicism. Late 18th century focused on imagination and individuals. There were also enlightenment and spirit of discovery. Here we come to the major writers and the works of the Augustan age. For the age of pop, we can mention names like Alexander Pope, Daniel DeVoe, Jonathan Swift, Felding, Addison, and Steele. And for the works, we have a nature of criticism, Robinson Crusoe, Gulliver's Travels, and others. And for the age of Johnson, here we have Samuel Johnson, of course, and then Boswell, Gray, Oliver Goldsmith, Gibbon, Stern, etc. And for the works, we have Dictionary of the English Language, Life of Samuel Johnson, The History of Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, and others. Now let's move to the next point, the rise of the novel. The rise of the novel in Augustan period. Novel is collection of story rather than well-structured plots. The novel began from the early 1700th century. But the fact, there are many earlier examples of fictional writing. The first Thomas Nees from 1567 to 1601. Thomas Nees was a pamphleteer, poet, dramatist, and author of The Unfortunate Traveler or the life of Jack Wilton from 1594. The Unfortunate Traveler was the first picarious novel in English. The second Arthur Ben. Arthur Ben was an English dramatist, fiction writer, and poet who was the first English woman known to earn her living by writing. Arthur Ben wrote about 13 novels, including love letters between a nobleman and his sister, from 1683. A novel in the form of letters, also called an epistolary novel. And the famous novel from Upper Ben is Oronoco from 1688. The third is Mary de la Riviere Manley from 1663 to 1724. Mary de la Riviere Manley was a British writer who achieved notoriety to presenting political scandal in the form of romance. Mary de la Rivera Manley wrote The Secret History of Queen Zara in 1701 and The New Atlantis in 1709. But in fact, this woman's writers, although their novels were very popular in their time, 
these women writers were, were outsiders in their society, which was dominated by men. The novels were not well considered by letter critics and completely ignored by the mostly male critics who followed. But when these themes were later handled in novels by men, they were not considered quite so objectionable. The fathers of the novel, rather than the mothers of the genre, were seen as writers who gave a strong moral position to the novel in the 18th century. In 1700th century, the most important people behind the rise of the novel are Daniel Deville and Jonathan Swift, and follow a little later by Samuel Richardson and Henry Fielding. Daniel Deville, 19, 1690 to 1731. Daniel Deville was an English novelist, pamphleteer, and journalist, author of Robinson Crusoe from 1719 to 1722, a journal of plague year from 1722, and Maul Flanders from 1722. Robinson Crusoe from 1790 to 1722 was Ramplatine. One of the most famous story in the world was inspired by the story of Alexander Clark, who had actually been on desert island for many years. The Vaux's technique is most of his novel is to use a verse person narrator and I who tells the story as if it had really happened. This is the picture of the novel. The next Jonathan's Swift from 1667 to 1745. Jonathan Swift was an Anglo-Irish author who was the famous Brazil satirist in the English language. Beside the famous novel Gulliver's Travels from 1726, he wrote such shorter works as A Tale of a Top from 1704 and A Modest Proposal from 1729. Swift's view of life was seen as pessimistic and against the mood of the times, and so his book was not taken seriously. Swift was the most original satire of his day. He is a writer of great range, a poet who could use everyday lang language in a way that not seems very modern, and a right who commented of society but was not understood. This is the book, Travels Around the World. The next Samuel Richardson, from 1689 to 1761. Samuel Richardson was an English novelist who expand to dramatic possibilities of the novel by his invention and use of the letter from epistolary novel. His major novel were Pamela from 1740 and Clarissa, 1747 to 1748. The next, Henry Fading from 1707 to 1758. Henry Fading was a novelist and playwright who with Samuel Richardson is considered a founder of English novel. His major novels are Joseph Andrews from 1742 and Tom Jones from 1749. In Fielding's novels, there is a wide range of comic characters and he helped to define the tradition of the English comics novel, focusing on the players of life. Of course, the men always have rather more freedom than the women. And there's always a moral story. The men always have rather more than freedom than the woman, and there is always a moral. Fielding's third person narrator often put in his own opinion for the benefit of the dear reader. This is the picture of Tom Jones. The summary of the rise of the novel. Since 1750, this novel has had various themes and styles. The range of narrative style and techniques in the novel varies, from the well first-person journalistic narrative to the letters and diary used by Richardson to Fielding's all-knowing third-person narrator, and from narrative to political, from romantic to comic, from social to satire. Novel after 1750, the first Charlotte Lennox, 
Charlotte Lennox was brought the life of Harriet Stewart in 1750 and the female Quixote in 1752. She concentrates on female experience from a female point of view, as her titles imply. The second is Sarah Fielding. Sarah is sister of Henry Fielding. Sarah called her most famous novel, uh, David Simple, okay, in 1744, complete in 1753, which is the name of the innocent hero who is looking for a real friend. He is disappointed and the novel is one of the earliest realistic works which avoids the traditional happy ending. Here the man rather than the woman in the victim. The next novel is Tristram Sandy from 1760 to 1767 by Lawrence Stern. This is a long comic story which plays with time, plot, and character and even with the shape and design of the page. Traditionally, a plot had a beginning, a middle, and an end. In that order, Stern was the first to change this order. He wanted to show how foolish it is to force everything into the traditional plot. The second, Stern was the first writer to use what came to be known as the stream of consci consciousness technique. In this, he was influenced by the essay concerning human understanding from 1690 by John Locke and histories about time, sensation, and the relation of one idea to another. The next, Tobias Smollett. Tobias Smollett was the major comic novelist of the second half of the 18th century. His novels, such Roderick Random from 1748 and Peregrine Pickle from 1751, are entertaining in which the heroes go traveling all over Europe. Smollett uses rich and original language to suit his characters, and he brings a new comic freedom to the, no to the novel after film. As early as 1757, the philosopher Edmund Burke had analyzed the pleasure of the mysterious and the frightening in his long essay, The Sublime, and the beautiful sublime, called to wonderful, and then also a short of delightful horror is the praise. Burke used to describe the kind of the pleasure of the Gothic novel would give. This analyze was a sign of an important break from the rational control of the Augustan and was one of the first steps towards the focus on feelings found later in the Henry Mackenzie and the early Romantic writer. In this slide, we are going to talk about Augustan poetry. When Dryden died in 1700, poetic satire was at its highest point, but no major poet followed him immediately. It was not until 1712 that the first two cantos of the Rap of the Law were published and Dryden successor. Pops danced yet. In 1733, uh, like Dryden's Macflick, no, an attack on the dualness of his literary rivals. Much of Pop's writing is about other writers or figures from the upper class society of the time, but his range of observation is not as limited as this might imply. As a poet, he made great use of the heroic couplet and his many works have met the English language literature with a number of famous lines, such as this from an essay on criticism. Lady Mary Wortley Montague is perhaps the best known of the many women poets of the time. She was a brain and later an enemy of pop. She was well known for her letters from Turkey and from Europe, but her poetry is famous too. Another woman poet is Mary Lieber, died at the age of only 24, but left some remarkable poems which were influenced by pop and were published after her death with Richardson's encouragement. Here, a man is making a proposal to a woman in a disneyly unromantic way. 
Most of the famous women writers of the century, from Susanna Sandlever to Clara Rivi, were also poets, but they are frequently not mentioned in histories of literature. The female poets, like Mary Lieber or Hetty Wright, are usually critical of male superiority in society. Perhaps this is why male critics have ignored them. As Hattie Wright said to her husband writing about an unhappy marriage. Next, the return to simpler values. In the 1740s, the graveyard cult of poetry had a moment of success. Their concern with dead and delightful gloom came about 20 years before similar ideas in the Gothic novel. Edward Young's Night Thought Poetry, 14 and 42, on life, death, and immortality, living forever, is a blank verse poem that created the taste throughout Europe for this kind of verse. It broke with the classical order and rationalism of Augustan poetry and completely relaxed the irony and wit of Pope and the other writers of his time. Robert Blair's The Grave in 1743 is a celebration of death and talks of being alone and of pain and madness. Thomas Gray's elegy written in a country churchyard, completed in 1750 and published in 1751, despite the title it has no real connection with the sad concern of the graveyard school. Its aims are quite different. Grey Poems is a realistic pastoral in simple four-line verses, far from the social and intellectual world of the Augustans. Robert Burns was the greatest Scottish poet, and many of his poems are written in Scots, a variety of English used in Scotland. His themes are nature and the humanity of nature. The Scottish writer James Macpherson caused a controversy with his books of verse Fingal in 1762 and Tamara in 1762. He had written this himself but said they were old poems by Ocean and epic poet writing in the Gaelic which Macpherson had translated. The Odyssey of William Collins published in 1746, had a great influence on later parts, they were sad and lyrical. Fanny Burney was more successful, at least as regards money and them. Her first novel, Evelina, in 1778, brought her immediate success. In conclusion, some of these writers and their works are described as pre-romantic. But this is only because they have been seen as coming before the romantic parts at the end of time. The rise of journalism and criticism, the new middle classes in journalism. The journalism of the early 18th century took the opinions and fashions of the capital city, London, to the whole nation. This was an important change in ways of thinking, especially outside the capital. A parallel growth in the communication of information and ideas happened in Scotland, from its capital city, Edinburgh. Scotland in the 18th century was a center of philosophical writings, for example, David Hume and the economics Adam Smith. London, however, was more concerned with society and manners, and with the gossip of the coffee houses, which were the center of London's literary life in the first half of the century. The Gentleman's Journal was the first of the these publications from 1692 to 1694 and then the Gentleman's Magazine from 1731 to 1914. The most famous of the early magazine were the Tatler and the Spectator. The first, begun by Richard Steele, ran from April 1709 until January 1711. The second started by Steele, with Joseph Edison, ran from March 1711 until December 1712. 
Edison continued to run it by himself from March 1714. Richard Steele's concept employed in the title Tatler was to publish the news and gossip heard in various London coffee houses. In reality, he mixed real gossip with invent stories of his own. And so he declared in the opening paragraph to leave the subject of politics to the newspaper while presenting wheezing views and correcting middle class manners. The journal was originally published three times a week and still eventually brought in contribution from his literary friends Jonathan Swift and Joseph Edison. Two both of them pretended to be writing as Isaac Baker's staff and authorship was relegated only when the papers were collected in a bound volume. The original title was published for only two years, from 12 April 1709 to 2 January 1711. The Spectator was presented as the magazine of a fictional gentleman's club and its leader Sir Roger de Coverley gave him opinions on every subject. The magazines were therefore important in expressing ideas and a point of view, setting standards of taste and judgment, and influencing the values of the society they worked for and about. The tone was not too intellectual or highbrow, and the term middlebrow later came to be used to describe this kind of journalism it can be seen as comfortable and saving writing and as model of politeness and good taste mr spectator states that the spectator will aim to enliven morality with wit and to temper wit with morality the journal reaches an audience of thousands of people every day because the spectator was something that middle classes hold house with aspiration to looking like it members to literature seriously would want to have. The spectator sought to provide readers with topics for well-reasoned discussion and to equip them to carry on conversations and engage to social interaction in a polite manner. In keeping with the values of enlightenment philosophies of their time, the authors of The Spectator promote family, marriage, and courtesy. Essays of criticism were also becoming popular. Dreaded had written several important critical pieces, and magazine often caused a lot of controversy when literary or political arguments were printed in their page. Many writers and editors had to pay fines or were even sent to the prison for expressing their opinions too strongly. Daniel Defoe was sent to prison for writing a pamphlet, The Shorter Way with the Dissenters, or Protests, in 1702. The major critic of the 18th century was Samuel Johnson. He started writing for magazine in 1737 and wrote a tragedy, Iran, 1737, and the novel, Results, 1759, to help pay his debts that he made him name with the publication of his Dictionary of the English Language published in 1755. After the success of the dictionary, he wrote a praise of Shakespeare in 1765. This was one of the first critical essays on Shakespeare and the beginning of the major tradition. Jensen also wrote the lips of the English poets in 1779 to 1781, which is important because it began a tradition of English literary criticism. Johnson, of course, made some wrong judgment, like any other critics. Letters and Diary Letters Lady Mary is today chiefly remembered for her letters, particularly her Turkish embassy letters describing her travel to the Ottoman Empire as wife to the British ambassador to Turkey, which Billy Millman described as the very first example of a secular work by a woman about the Muslim Orient. Aside from her writing, Lady Mary is also known for introducing and advocating for smallpox 
inoculation to Britain after her return from Turkey. Her writings address and challenge the hindering contemporary social attitude towards women and their intellectual and social growth. Diary Samuel Pepys was an English diary and naval administrator. He served as administrator of the Navy of England and member parliament and is most famous for the diary he kept for a decade while still a young man. On the 1st January 1660, Pepys began to keep a diary. He recorded his daily life for almost 10 years. This record for a decade of Pepys' life is more than a million words long and is often regarded as Britain's most celebrated diary. Pepys has been called the greatest diarist of all time due to his frankness in writing concerning his own weakness and the accuracy with which he records events of daily life and major events in 7th century. Pepys wrote about the con contemporary court and theater, his household, and major political and social occurrence. John Evelyn was an English writer, gardener, and diarist. Evelyn's diary remained unpublished as a manuscript until 1818. It is in quarto volume containing 700 pages covering the years between 1641 and 1697, and it continues a smaller book, which brings the narrative down to within three weeks of its other death. Despite entries going back to 1641, Evelyn only actually started writing his diary much later, relying on almanacs and account of other people for many of the previous events. A selection from this was edited by William Bray with the permission of the Evelyn family in 1818 under the title of Memories Illustrative of the Life and Writings of John Evelyn, conspiring his diary from 1641 to 1705 or 6, and a selection of his family letters. Other editions follow, the most notable being those of H. B. Whitley, 1879, and Austin Dobson, 1879-1893.